Welcome uh, every, everyone uh, to this mini symposium. It is called uh, Trans People Human Rights Under Attack. And we are going to be um, talking about anti-gender movements and their attack against our human rights, but also about gender ideology and how it is being used to repathologize uh, trans people. In these sessions, we're going to have four presenters. The session is going to take place as a conversation among the four of us. And we are going to start with a short round of introductions, starting with Keenan. Thanks, Maro. Um, hi, my name is Keenan Russell. I'm a senior policy officer at ILGA Europe, uh, based in Brussels. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, and in terms of uh, this topic of uh, gender ideology and uh, sort of anti-trans movements and attacks, uh, my, my interest is largely in the, the larger system, how uh, our opposition works, how you can look for commonalities in strategies between the left and the right in their attacks on trans people and the human rights of trans people, um, and how to develop robust responses to those things. So I, I really take a more sort of theoretical, structural approach to this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Keenan. What about you, Leo? Hi, my name is Leo Mulio. I'm the Health Policy Officer in Transgender Europe, TGU. We are based in Berlin and in Germany, and we are the Trans Umbrella Organization working for the rights of trans people in Europe and Central Asia. And well, similarly to, to Europe to Keenan's work, we're also focusing on more of the, the big picture uh, when it comes to anti-gender movements, understanding all the um, how, how it really works. Uh, there's still a lot, so we're really learning um, and also trying to figure out how to combat that movement, how we can support the community and how can we protect trans rights while we're getting all these attacks. So really looking out there, seeing how that's impacting trans people's lives and trying to be there for the community to better support them, understanding their strategy so that we can actually come up with a good strategy uh, to counter the, the impact that they're having in the community. Thank you very much, Leo. So let's cross the, the ocean and go to North America. So what about you, Florence? Hi, so I'm Florence Ashley. I'm a, a jurist and bioethicist. I use they them pronouns. I'm currently located in Toronto, uh, where I am doing a doctorate in law and bioethics at the University of Toronto. Uh, my work focuses quite a lot on the legal and ethical issues surrounding uh, approaches to trans care, and I focus a lot on conversion therapy and also on pro-conversion therapy ideologies like rapid onset gender dysphoria, so how these narratives are being deployed in order to favor uh, the repathologization of trans people. Thank you very much. And in, in my case, well, I am Mauro Carvel Greenspan. I am the executive director of GATE. GATE is an international organization that works on gender identity, gender expressions, and sex characteristics issues. And I'm based in Argentina. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, what GATE is doing right now is a map of what we call anti-gender organizing against uh, trans people. And we are including in that map what we call conservative anti-gender organizing, uh, all those uh, movements, uh, political parties, religious uh, institutions at the right in the political spectrum, like have a conservative <clears throat> position defending the natural order, for example, but also the radical anti-gender organizing, including some uh, trans exclusionary feminist groups and some LGB uh, groups that have a very strong anti-trans uh, agenda. Uh, personal, personally, uh, and coming from history as my professional field, I am very interested in the kind of narratives that these movements are telling and what is the role of uh, the anti-trans rhetoric in building their understanding of the world. So, Starting, you know, taking that as a uh, starting point, I want to come back uh, to Keenan to uh, pay attention 
to one of the, the, the key forms of this anti-trans uh, rhetoric. It is called gender, gender ideology. And it's been used against trans people, but also against other uh, communities around the world. Thanks, Mauro. Um, I think the place to start here is that we need to be, uh, we need to think about this in the same way that we do a lot of other constructions used by people to sort of create uh, a, a fallacy. Uh, you know, so um, when I imagine when Florence is speaking a bit later, for example, that they might say so-called conversion therapy, and we should be using the same frame of reference when talking about gender ideology. Um, gender ideology is, is a so-called it's a it's a, a fabrication uh, initially of the rights and the and the very conservative religious rights centering in the Vatican evangelical Christians um, but it's it's a construction uh, what historically happened is uh, we moved it particularly in international human rights discourses from talking only about sex and about men and women to talking about gender. Uh, and gender showing up in, in international human rights language. Uh, and that created what originally was considered a backlash where the right pushed back on that gain of ground. Um, but we've learned since then that it wasn't a backlash at all, but really uh, an opportunistic attack on the fundamental rights of LGBTI people, of uh, women and others who need access to abortion and contraceptives, um, and, and that it was a, a window to sort of condense that attack rather than a response to something that was, uh, was harming the, the right, as it were, uh, in that moment. So um, what happened in that, in that moment was a creation of a, of a strategy, uh, a European one, a global one, to uh, try to undermine those advancements in rights uh, and try to bring, as, as Maurer was saying earlier, that one of, the, one of the languages there is restoring the natural order, bringing us back to traditional families or uh, to, to uh, the good old days uh, or whatever the way that one wants to refer to that. Uh, and to do that, you have to vilify the gains in the human rights field that have come in the past 10, 20 years, uh, particularly as it, as it pertains to trans people. Um, and so uh, gender ideology is what they called the development of protections of the fundamental rights without discrimination uh, of trans people. But the real name for those things is fundamental rights without discrimination on the basis of gender identity or gender expression. Um, what they're doing is sort of flipping that around and turning the equal access to protection that all people should have in the human rights framework into something that they assert harms them or harms their religion or harms their family. That assertion, though, is a lie. It's a falsehood. Uh, their family, their religion, those things aren't harmed at all by uh, any of us being able to have access to legal gender recognition or have access to trans uh, specific healthcare, um, what, they're, what, what is harmed is their ability to control everyone, to control me and you uh, and, and other trans people and non-trans people around the world. And so um, they've created this fa falsehood and termed it gender ideology, saying that we on, in the trans movement are promoting gender ideology. We're not, we're promoting our own fundamental rights. Uh, and so that's, that's a basic piece of information uh, that we need to understand in this conversation is they are opposed to something, but that something that they're opposed to is fake. Thank you very much for for that, uh, Keenan. And you said that they are they are opposing something that is fake, and of course we we agree with with that. But it's also true, and you mentioned that, and also you know. Uh, Florence and, and Leo, that they are doing that in very concrete ways and concrete ways that are related with human rights violations. And one of the most shocking uh, strategies being used by anti-gender movements using this fallacy of 
uh, gender ideology is that they are promote, promoting conversion therapies. Uh, it's difficult to imagine, I will never, as an activist, I would have never imagined that in 2020, we will need to be organizing again uh, to resist conversion therapies. And that actually we will, you know, we were going to find that there are groups that consider, for example, that trans people are actually um, gay and lesbian people that have been converted into trans people and it is necessary to reconvert us again. Or for example, as it happened in a dialogue with the UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity issues, that is trying to convince his mandate to abandon the work on gender identity issues because trans people are a cult and a dangerous one. And that actually a conversion therapy should be banned for everyone, but not for us because we need it, we need that. So I will move now uh, to Florence to address this uh, very strange but dangerous combination of pseudo uh, science and uh, you know human rights violations used as human rights uh, principles and how all of that is working against trans people and our human rights at this moment. Yeah, so there is this very insidious inversion of the what they call conversion therapy. So conversion therapy is this attempt to change or discourage or suppress someone's sexual orientation, gender identity, gender modality or gender expression or related uh, behaviors. And here they're really attempting to invert the narratives by saying, well, actually, we're not doing conversion therapy on trans people, they're doing conversion therapy on gay people because when they transition, they oftentimes go from being uh, gay from, to being straight. Uh, well, first, that is an extremely superficial understanding of, uh, of sexual orientation and what's going on. The desire itself is not uh, is not changing and it also forgets the fact that most trans people who are straight still continue to be stigmatized as being gay because they're not being recognized in their gender. Uh, so there's a kind of like counterfactual aspect and also the other counterfactual aspect is the fact that for the most part relatively few trans people are straight, most trans people are actually queer and primarily bisexual or pansexual, statistically speaking. So for the most part, people are changing sexual orientation from bisexual to bisexual. It's not a huge change. Uh, so, so that whole narrative is, is a little bit weird on a factual basis, but they're really trying to do to legitimate it through the weaponization of scientific language. And the way that they found that is to repathologize trans people as having what they call rapid onset gender dysphoria. And you know, the problem here is, of course, as the problem with pathologization in general is not necessarily that's labeling trans people as uh, disordered or disabled because that's you know not always a problem in and of itself but the way that they're doing it as placing it as a psychological problem that is rooted in um, social contagion and uh, and trauma so essentially what they're saying is oh we have this uh, this huge explosion of trans people that are actually being misled, like are, are you know, primarily lesbians and uh, also some uh, gay men that are being misled into believing that they're trans because they have gender related trauma and they want to kind of flee their womanhood or flee uh, into being straight because it's preferable for them to be straight. And they're elevating that phenomenon that uh, into some sort of social contagion to then push for more conversion therapy on trans people by saying well they're not really trans people and we need them to accept themselves as cis gender non-conforming queer uh, people and then that gets taken up by uh, you know deeply conservative movements like 
in the US, we're seeing attempts to pass legislation that would criminalize trans youth care. And they are citing these, uh, these attempts and they're citing it as though it were legitimate science, even though uh, the science has been so have thoroughly criticized uh, in uh, by my own peer reviewed research and also other people like uh, uh, by other people, you know, both in scientific fields and in more uh, and in outside of science and community thoroughly discredited, but it is being used to kind of give this this veneer of scientific legitimacy to promoting conversion therapy under the guise of opposing conversion therapy. Thank you very much, uh, Florence. And I'm going to go now to, uh, uh, to Leo. Uh, Leo, uh, as uh, he said, is working for TGU, but also uh, you are from Spain and, you know, many people in the English speaking world have heard about anti-gender organizing uh, against trans people, for example, in the UK or in the US. And because of some language uh, barriers, maybe they are not, um, they don't know that, uh, that much about what's going on in Spain and what is the situation um, right now. So could you, you know, take the Spanish situation a starting point to refer to these attacks uh, against trans people in your region. Yeah, thank you, Mauro. Um, yeah, I actually think, of course, it's deeply worrying and especially for me coming from Spain, it's very concerning, but I think it's also a very interesting example to talk about all the things we're actually discussing today, because in Spain, we've seen the far right and the, the extreme um, religious movement about gender ideology more in the way Keenan was explaining earlier but and we're also seeing right now very recently actually this year also the the left and the feminist groups that are also attacking trans people so we've kind of seen both uh both things in Spain in a kind of a short time in a very few years both have come together and we're seeing that even the left movements and the feminists are sharing arguments saying the same things and the extreme right was saying a few very few years ago um, and, and in our case in, in Spain this year, for example, um, feminist groups, even within political parties that have been historically allies for, for trans rights, for trans people like PSOE, the Socialist Party in Spain, um, that has supported legislation like the, the LGR law that we have right now in Spain, um, are opposing, for example, the self-determination that it's, it's being proposed in Spain. Um, and, and they've put out this document, which is not official from a party, but has come through that party, uh, talking about the erasure of women. So again, this fallacy that Keenan was um, mentioning before, but in this case, saying that people are uh, trans people are going against women's rights. Um, so I think we, we can see a lot of similarities between movements within the anti-gender movements, or with this fallacy of trans people taking over and going against other groups' uh, rights, in this case, women's, but also talking about how we're targeting basically the entire population and how our agenda goes against society in general, which I think is one of the tactics of this, of this movement. Um, for example, this uh, social panic that these movements uh, are, are using as a strategy to, to scare people um, and to turn them against, uh, against trans people, but also by dehumanizing and using terms and, and language um, that's dehumanizing for trans people. When they use this term gender ideology, it's a way of also dehumanizing us and, and for people not to empathize with, with trans people and see us as some kind of weird theory or concept that's not um, really human. In Spain, for example, we've seen the term queer theory. So uh this has been the term and with there they are even talking about trans people as queer theory so que queer theory is targeting women's rights so we're seeing these terms being used as a as a synonym for trans people or for trans rights uh which we of course think it's a it's another of their strategies right um and and as i was saying we saw this campaign a few years ago with this orange bus that I would think was pretty known internationally. It also went out to, from Spain to other countries I am aware of. Um, from this platform, Ateoir, which is part of the Citizen Go international uh, platform. 
um, saying boys have penises, girls have vulvas, which is basically the same thing sort of, uh, trans exclusionary feminists are saying right now, women are women because they're born with certain traits and men. So talking about biological determinism, um, and we're even seeing that uh, uh, feminists are also using the term gender ideology now when that was only used by uh, extreme right a few a few years ago. Um, in our case in Spain, again, the trigger uh, this year has been the, the self-determination proposal. Um, and so this has uh, made feminists, ex some, some feminists explode, but some feminists with a lot of power in Spain. So they're being heard a lot even though we do think that they're a, minor, a minority um, and saying that people cannot just claim to be a woman. So again, uh, going back to the issue here, which is the repopulization of trans people. So, so saying people cannot just claim their gender. They have, to be, they have to be assessed. We cannot trust people in their gender. They don't have the power or the right to decide who they are. We have to assess them and they have to go through, this, uh, through these pathologizing processes, right? Um, so that's what we're seeing right now. And actually in Spain, the law is stuck. It's been for years and now they're actually starting to work on it to create working groups, but just making it much longer than, than it should have been. I mean, the, the draft is ready, it's there and supported by, by, trans, by the trans community. And they're going back to the beginning to actually discuss the basics because there are such big conflicts within political parties and, and groups that they're going really, really slow. And, and, and yeah, just to add that this is another, this is one of the examples, but we're seeing this happening in many countries in Europe, actually we've seen the same in the UK uh, with a lot of women's uh, groups attacking trans rights, like you said earlier, Mauro, with LGB uh, organizations being created to, again, attack trans rights, specific organizations targeting or going against uh, education uh, in, in diversity, you know, diversity education in, in schools, uh, going to court against uh, institutions in the UK for allowing or encouraging schools to teach uh, diversity uh, in the curriculum. So um, it is having an impact in, in many countries, both in countries like Hungary, for example, by banning LGR for trans people completely. Not We're not even talking about self-determination or any, just, or any requirements in general, just literally banning uh, the option for, for trans people to change their, their gender legally, uh, more coming from these right or conservative movements, but also, again, coming from the left in countries like, like the UK or Spain. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Leo. Uh, to speak a bit about what we see, you know, for example, in, in Latin America, uh, here we have the same combination from movements, you know, in coming from the right, the far right, and coming from the left, and even the far, the far left, and with uh, um, with an addition, which is like that many feminists opposing or LGB people or people on the left opposing uh, trans rights, they're using the language of uh, decolonization. So they believe the trans people, like the gender as, as language and trans people as, as part of that gender umbrella, as we are being um, exported by, for example, the, the, um, the World Bank or development agencies and opposing gender framework and opposing trans people is a way of decolonizing uh, indigenous people in the, in the region. What we are seeing in terms also in the way in which these, these rhetorics are working is that sometimes they're not exactly about trans people ourselves. That it would be very easy actually to identify that rhetoric as, for example, anti-democratic and considering that the very existence of some people is open to debate and extremely anti-migrant. And, and racist, this idea like just people are people that they don't look like us and that's a problem. And because they don't look like us or their histories or their culture is different than ours, they put us at risk. So they are dangerous people. And, but also there, there is not, there are not enough human rights for all. And all these debates about trans people coming after women's rights 
uh, had at, a, in, at, the, at the core this idea that there are not enough rights for everyone. So, and in that sense, these people are coming to take a right. And, and some people, for example, in Argentina, we don't have right now, you know, abortion is not legal. And they're feminists saying, for example, but we don't have abortion because trans people uh, go the gender identity law. I said, but how is that even possible? There's also this idea that we are super powerful and that the World Health Organization uh, depathologized uh, trans people because we have a very a wealthy uh, trans lobby uh, putting pressure there. So it's a very uh, strange combination of pro-science and anti-science uh, approaches but it's not only limited to, tra to trans people. So it's not only about us, the same is said about many other, many other things, including the, the conspiracy uh, approach. And when it be about this conspiracy and, and protecting people and protecting our rights, there is a group of people that is again at the, at the core of the, of the fear. And this is a moment when trans, uh, trans and gender diverse children and teenagers, but especially uh, children, um, are being used um, uh, to promote uh, debates about is this is right for, for trans people not only to have access to human rights, but to exist in the sense that our very existence is presented as a risk to children in the sense that as what Florian was saying, um, just by existing, we are making children believe that being trans is okay and that we are actually converting children into trans. So what I'm going to invite us as a group is to reflect on this anti-gender and anti-trans war on, on children and the way in which children are being used as a weapon against uh, about trans uh, trans people. So Kingdom, would you like to start? I think Florence is gonna start. Go ahead, Florence. Uh, sorry. 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 <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a little interesting clip first before going there because you mentioned, you know, this idea of the powerful lobby. And I always think that's, you know, interesting slash funny slash sad because if we're so powerful then how come there are constantly hormone shortages you know like because they're saying oh it's because of the pharmaceutical interest but clearly the pharmaceutical companies don't think they're making money on us because they're constantly stopping producing and then they have to you know it leads to shortages so i always find that a little bit funny uh, but going to the children i think you know it's important to notice that it's not the first time that we've had a mobilization of poor science in the, or pseudoscience as we see with rapid onset gender dysphoria. And, and, and when I say, you know, I think it lies on the line between poor science and pseudoscience because uh, in a way it is unfalsifiable because they always find ad hoc uh, changes to explain any, uh, anything we, we propose as undermining their argument. They're always saying, oh, well, it's because they're lying or something like that. Uh, but, um, you know, we've seen this mobilization before in the form of autogynephilia theory. And it was used to say, oh, well, trans women are actually perverts who are a danger to women because they are actually, you know, misled heterosexual cis men who are attracted to the idea of them as, uh, as, as women. And that's how we got to this high of like, and that was kind of like the, the scientific background that was being used to promote things like banning trans women from women's spaces and from bathrooms and things like that. But the problem is that was primarily, uh, there was a huge focus on their danger to adults. And yes, there was a little bit of talk of the danger of trans people in bathroom to uh, to children, but a lot of it was focused on uh, on the narrative of danger to adult women, and the danger of that trans people themselves. 
outposts. And narratively, they've kind of lost that fight in a lot of ways. Yes, there is still a lot of uh, of that argument going around, but it has lost a lot of currency uh, compared to what it might have had a number of years ago. And I think that's where we see the shift to focusing on the children because, but think of the children is so powerful politically that you can kind of like get past the lack of empirical support for your position. Because at some point with like, for instance, the bathrooms, they had to come to, gra to, to grips with the fact that there was no empirical evidence of anything like that happening. But once you move towards a narrative of the children are being misled and are, and are hurting themselves, then you're really calling upon that very emotional, you know, place in people's hearts that is much more resistant to being disproved with facts. So I think that in a way, the move towards um, but think of the children can be seen as evidence of losing grounds on the empirical and the scientific field of, uh, of the kind of the battle and retreating to this much more um, emotional and intuitive place where they don't have to put forward uh, much in terms of evidence because people are so willing to go to the bat for children. And so I think like that's like that kind of partly explains. And of course, there's a lot of forces at play, but I think that partly explains why we see this happening. Um, so I'm going to let uh, uh, Kenan talk more about, uh, about their perspective on that. Thanks, Florence. Uh, yeah, I mean, the piece of this that I'd really like to, to take a little bit further jumps off of what uh, Florence was just saying, this sort of think of the children, you know, oh, oh God, save the children thought process. Um, when you put children at the center of an argument in a way like this, one of the fundamental uh, pieces of how that works is that we don't trust children to know anything. Uh, you know, children are, are seen as highly uh, influenceable, highly malleable, not very well aware of what they need uh, or what they think or what they feel. And that, that's actually central to being able to use them in the way uh, that both the right and the left are using them right now to attempt to undercut trans rights, right? So uh, the assertion, for example, that uh, exposure of children to comprehensive sex education that is inclusive of gender identity and gender expression issues uh, will cause them to identify as trans, right? That assertion is dependent on being undisprovable. Uh, you can't possibly disprove that exposure to discussions of gender, gender, gender identity and gender expression will, will encourage more people to be trans for several reasons. The first of them is that exposure to information about your options, of course, makes people more willing to explore their options. So there is often more people talking about a thing that makes people who would likely become trans when they learned about it at some point in the future come out as trans earlier. So, so there is this like way in which that argument appears true. Uh, the other piece is when you talk about something that also creates a, a more permissive environment, an environment that allows people who again would come out when the pressure became great enough to come out earlier because they feel like it's, it's possible. Um, but the third part of that is we wouldn't believe a child if they said they were trans to begin with uh, and that this just created space for them because we don't trust children to tell us the truth. And this manifests, uh, and, and I, I wanna draw this back to pathologization, this manifests in exactly the way that we treat trans children and provide barriers to their access to transition-related healthcare. So we say, we're gonna take the so-called wait and see approach and make you wait for a while specifically because we don't trust you and don't believe what you say about who you are. Uh, and and that, that is exactly the same type of argumentation 
as arguments that say we can't provide comprehensive sex education, again, because we don't trust you, child, to make decisions about who you are and, and what you're going to become and how is best to treat you. Um, so seeing these as two sides of the same coin, I think is a really important piece. Uh, the other piece I want, I want to draw on very briefly is uh, that uh, hysteria around protecting children is a, is a radically common thread when talking about the anti-democracy, anti-gender, anti-rights movements. You see it from uh, QAnon in the US right now, right? The whole undercurrent of save the children from some undescribable or unpin downable or even uncombatable uh, threat to uh, a few months ago in Bulgaria, this sort of social media misinformation campaign uh, against the Child Protective Services Act, uh, where the opposition to that act, again, sort of the traditional far right, uh, told a bunch of Bulgarian citizens, uh, if Child Protective Services gets the power, they will take your children away from you for any minor infraction and send them to be adopted by gay couples uh, in Norway. Um, that assertion is based on fear and on playing on people's fear about the, their, their family, which is a, 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 a base root fear. Uh, and so it doesn't matter how ridiculous the assertion is, when it plays on that specific kind of fear. And, and that is where the anti-gender movement tactic becomes really clear. They're playing on a fear that is so fundamental to who we are as a species that we're, we don't do a good job of actually looking at the, the threat, the so-called threat and determining if it's a threat. Our automatic reaction is fight or flight because there is a perception of a threat and we don't figure out, is there really a threat? I'll pass the floor to Lee to take us from there. Thank you, Keenan. No, just very briefly, um, I wanted to add to that that fear that you were mentioning that the level of lies and manipulation is is huge. Like, um, I think they're so confident that people are scared when they talk about children and and, and seeing society's reaction that they're um, daring to say things like protecting children from irreversible changes and all these big words when children really don't go through any irreversible changes. Uh, but this happens even when talking about LGR, for example, or any other thing. And people are, society, out of fear, are thinking, uh, oh, children are getting surgeries. So I think we do have a lot of work there to explain what trans children really, who they are really, what their needs are, and what transitioning as a child means um to uh to deconstruct that that fear that's growing so fast and on a positive note also i'd like to highlight that we are seeing how um the positive stories of children and families supporting trans children are also getting out there and getting a lot of support publicly um in, in spain for example when we had this bus talking about children uh that really got to, to those who also were supporting trans people. So society uh, reacted uh, very publicly, very strongly against this bus by Yateoir, saying that boys are boys and girls are girls. So against, uh, against trans kids uh, saying, uh, supporting trans kids. So I think um, that support is also out there for trans kids and we have to continue working on that, but it's also there. And we're also seeing the growth of associations of, of uh, parents of trans kids as well, which is growing a lot recently. So I do think we, we can continue working there, but definitely that's one of the big arguments, the protect our children uh, tactic. I'm not sure. So we've temporarily lo temporarily lost Mauro. So just to kind of keep us on on schedule and on the thread, um, would one of you like to to bring us ar around to to what we can do? Uh, what what can what can be done next? Maybe Leo, we haven't actually started with you on any of these rounds. Do you want to take that first? What can we do? And closing thoughts from you. Sure. Well, I think. Uh... At least what we're seeing on our side as TGU, that we have to continue doing the, the support that we're offering and, and calling out uh, the attacks. Um, for sure, we need to do that. But we're 
uh, we have to get a bit uh, ahead of the situation. We're seeing ourselves in a position of many times reacting to the attacks and we want to make sure to work proactively because it's getting, it's getting too much. So we need to make sure that we understand what's happening, that we uh, build strategies. And I think especially thinking about um, uh, how to connect with allies. I think we have to work together with other movements, with other groups. Uh, first of all, because we're not enough. I wish I would I would meet those powerful trans people that they talk about, but I haven't met them yet. Uh, so I think we're going to have to really work on our on our alliances with other with other movements. Um, also to show that to go against the fallacy that it's us against someone else or uh, or against society, and to show that we're really together on this, um, and that we're not targeting anyone's rights while um, supporting ours or guaranteeing ours. Um, and I think we have to show that, that the majority is actually uh, not even aware of what's going on. Um, I think one of the tactics that they have, one of their strategies is to pretend like they are the majority, uh, that they are representing society um, and that we are this elite or this cult that's going against the majority's um, benefit or um, rights or society in general as a whole. And we need to show that that's not, that's not the case, um, that we're all working together and that we're not uh, going against any, any group's rights. Um, and, and show that most of the people, even sometimes those supporting these groups are not even aware of what's going on and they're voting for things and supporting arguments that they don't really understand. And I think in that sense, we need to understand that transphobia is out there. And that's the reason why we see these arguments coming from extreme right or from extreme left, because transphobia is everywhere all, in all sectors of society. So it, it really uh, gets out there really fast and it convinces people really fast because transphobia is in everyone's heads, even in trans people's heads. I mean, we've grown within as a sexist uh, society. So it's, it's there, it's in everyone's hearts and, and minds and 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 so many many people don't even know what's going on but it's they're buying the message because it, it fits their already existing prejudice against trans people so we need to work with those people especially because again i think these voices are not the majority we have to prove that they're not the majority and we'd rather i think focus on all of those who are really the majority that don't know what's going on to for them to learn what's happening and and to uh, to help us support our, our rights. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. And I excuse myself for my short absence due to technical, to technical issues. Uh, so let's continue with this, with this uh, round of um, recommendations in terms of points uh, for action. Yeah, um, so I can go next and I, think for my part, um, I'm going to want to focus a little bit on, you know, the kind of clinicians aspect of it, since this is a WPAP conference and some of the people listening are going to be, uh, you know, cis healthcare providers. And for cis healthcare providers, what I want to emphasize is one, get involved and two, center trans expertise. So the first part in terms of getting involved is is a matter of getting to understand that you can't do trans care in a clinical setting without taking into account everything that's going on socially and legally. So uh, it's important to understand what is going on in terms of misinformation and use expertise and privilege as a, a you know as a doctor, as a uh, as a psychologist, as all of those very privileged professions to correct misinformation. So really get your voice in there and say, no, like this is actually false and they're misrepresenting the science. And also in terms of pushing for protective laws around ensuring that trans people have proper healthcare access, have anti-discrimination protections, have you know access to housing and have protections against conversion therapies and all of those protective laws that will allow them to not constantly be fighting from a, a, a reactive standpoint, not and be able to actually push for their well being without always being on the back foot, which is often a problem right now because it feels like we're always on the defensive. And that's 
politically difficult as a place to be. And I think that, you know, as, you know, wanting to be more than allies, wanting to be what I call assistants uh, of the movement is using your privilege to kind of push back against this, this kind of anti-trans backlash so that to make room for trans people to advocate, to go further. Uh, and also I think it's important to center trans expertise. And the first thing I wanna say there is that it means also deconstructing what we understand as expertise because expertise doesn't just come from being a professor. Trans people have been excluded from those positions of power uh, you know, for so long that they often don't get to have these, these roles, even though they're absolutely brilliant. And even though a lot of what we need to know for trans people is stuff that you learn doing community work, is what you learn working with trans people, is what you learn uh, working against in advocacy, in the, against anti-trans movement. So it's important to understand how expertise is. Yes, it's trans people who like me are very, you know, academics and, and, and publish in journals and stuff like that. But it's also everyone else who does super important work. And a lot of the time, no more than me, I feel. And I actually draw on them to write my uh, academic articles. So uh, important to understand that that is real expertise and that trans people need to be actively involved in priority setting for, science, for scientific research and publications because lying. And also, you know, it also means things like giving journals space because a lot of people, you know, at W Patton elsewhere have editorial positions on uh, on journals and those journals are important spaces for fighting against, you know, the anti-trans movement because they come with, you know, a certain level of legitimacy. So you need to give that space actively, you know, like seek out trans people to write about those issues and give them a space to write about those issues while also using your editorial position to kind of like say, look, I'm publishing this because they know what's up. They're actually telling you what is happening. They're telling you the truth. And by placing them there, you're, you're kind of promoting these voices. So it's really important to center trans expertise by, you know, letting them inform your work and also by giving them space and promoting their voices and adding your legitimacy behind their voices so that they start being heard more by the broader population as people who know what is happening, who know what is true, what is good for trans people and what is good for society. Thank you very much, um, Florence. Uh, what about Keenan? Uh, what about you, Keenan? What do you think? Um, I've, I've just got a couple of things to add shortly. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that Leo and uh, Florence have said so far. Um, on, on this last piece about uh, making space and using the, the access that, that you have, um, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a requirement for cis people in this circumstance to take risk uh, and not place all of the potential harm and risk on the bodies and lives of trans people. Uh, that means being willing to engage the discussion, to uh, put the time and effort into responding to the hysterical assertions of uh, anti-trans actors, to the uh, baseless assertions uh, that, that show up in the media. Um, there are really a limited number of us, honestly. And there's even a smaller number of us who are activists. And we are getting assaulted from both the left and the right all day, every day. Uh, not just in terms of uh, sort of some uh, detached, uh, impersonal issue. You know, it's not about the value of our stock. It's about my ability to live in my body, in my life, with my uh, identity recognized by the state and other individuals on the line every single day and in the media every single day. Uh, and we're not gonna win that 
with the small number of us pushing back against the mainstream media as a, as a system. So sh show up, contact the guardian and say, you've got to stop writing this way because it's bigoted and harmful. You do that uh, as, as cis providers who have clout and leverage, because I can say, stop writing about me like this all day. And at the end of the day, the only thing I will have is a sore throat uh, because I'm, it's about me. So, so I have a stake in the game. And another piece of my recommendation is, goes off from that. Uh, very often, anti-trans actors and trans people are positioned as sort of equivalent opponents in a debate. And honestly, that, that is one of the most harmful things that those attempting to theoretically create space for this conversation can do. It is not a debate when uh, trans exclusionary so-called feminists assert that uh, I am insane, that I am seeking to harm them when they lie about me uh, in a way to undermine my human rights. Uh, and then I am in, in and all, I, all I'm able to say is the things you are saying is false. Uh, because what you're doing is, is creating a, a monster out of me. Uh, that's not a debate. Uh, and you can't treat these two quote unquote sides as sides. There is one aggressor. There's one uh, attacker. And that is the trans exclusionary actors. Uh, trans people are on the defense and only on the defense. There is no offense on our side in this so-called debate or so-called battle. And and the framers of that conversation are cis people. They are journalists, they are doctors, they are people in your own families. Uh, and, and you have to frame that in a way that is honest. There is one aggressor and one defender in this battle. And, and, and then that starts to clarify itself. Um, for, for, for time, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it there and pass it back to you, Mal. Thank you very much, Keenan. Um, I have my own set of recommendations and some of those recommendations are for trans people uh, ourselves. And how to do with, and, and I know that this is really difficult, but at some point we will need to pay less attention or to stop paying attention. I want to be realistic here. So let's say, let's less attention, pay less attention to, for example, uh, anti-gender attacks against trans people in social media. Uh, our communities are devoting a massive amount of time focusing on the banking uh, meets and, and uh, you know, responding to hate speech. And what is happening is that the, all the political energy in our movements is, is being consumed by this black hole of hate against trans people and nothing is changing. So one recommendation is try, let's try to focus our attention uh, in engaging in advocacy with, for example, professional associations with, with, with not only psychomedical, but also uh, legal and bioethical. Let's talk with, with governments, with diplomats, with parliamentarians, with, uh, with journalists. So if we can and possible, let's stop arguing with haters uh, online uh, because it's, that's destroying us and destroying our movements. The second recommendation has to do with intersex issues and we didn't talk much or we didn't talk at all about intersex people in this conversation, but something that is happening from both uh, left and right in gender organizing, but also with trans activists is that as always intersex people and our bodies, I'm an intersex person myself, are being used as a proof. So it is used to prove that actually sex is binary and intersex people are just people with malformations, or it is used to prove that actually sex is not binary and that our very existence proves that there is a multiplicity of sex. So stop using intersex as an argument. We are not in the world to provide a tool for arguments uh, in favor of against uh, other communities' rights. Uh, intersex people and our own rights are suffering a lot because of this constant use of intersex bodies as an argument, especially coming from anti-gender. What is happening is that we are 
been repathologized as many people, you know, in the sorry, in conservative radical movements are saying intersect people are malformed, they need surgery, they are going to be fine. And, and that's really a horrible way of using us. But making us uh, just a piece of flesh that can be used to advance trans rights is also wrong. It's not equally wrong, but it's also wrong. So, trans, so intersex people have no, you know, the, the mission uh, to prove anything to anyone. Having that uh, clarified, I uh, hope so. I would really love to come back to the issue of, of trans expertise. Um, a very sad um, heritage from, from pathologizing trans people and something that's still there is, it, is the idea that we can be trusted when it comes to be about producing knowledge because we are biased and because um, because it's about our rights. And even people that believe that in, in cis patriarchy, they don't believe that being cis can be a conflict of interest. They believe that the conflict of interest as knowers always is placed on, on trans people. So we need to dismantle that. And personally, I would love people to stop referring to trans people as experts on ourselves when cis people can be experts on everything. We can be experts on many things and not only on ourselves, which is a way of saying, actually, you're only expert in providing testimony or you're only an expert of being yourself and communicate that to the world. Uh, finally, I'm, I'm coming from a country, like half of the country has been on fire, actually, you know, we have fires uh, everywhere. We have problems with fracking, with climate change, uh, with massive public uh, debt, with poverty, and people are obsessed about trans people, you know, uh, being legally recognized. So, just for people in Argentina, in Latin America, around the world, to pay attention to this kind of distractions. There are huge processes happening politically, climatically, uh, economically, and we need to pay attention to that. There are many kind of conspiracies trying to distract public attention. Trans people and our rights, uh, or us being a threat, we're just one of them. And it's extremely dangerous to us, but it's also extremely dangerous to you if you are allow yourself and you don't say, you know, use your voice to say, look, uh, trans people are not a problem. Let's talk about the government. Let's talk about the climate. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about imperialism. Uh, all of that, you know, should be in the center of audiences around, uh, around the world. So I know that that um, we are facing this huge problem of fake news everywhere, of people doing research on Google, of you know many people not knowing exactly what the truth uh, is. But together, we can we can work in terms of refocusing attention on human rights and to stop allowing certain communities and extremely vulnerable communities like migrants or like trans people to reuse as scapegoats, uh, to be used to distract political attention and to stop political mobilization on, on those issues. Uh, so unless uh, my, my colleagues here want to make other remarks, I think that we are um, a bit over time, so we should close the session soon. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say uh, thanks, uh, Mauro, for uh, for organizing this and for moderating. Uh, and I hope that the uh, attendees will have learned a lot. Yeah, thanks very much, Mauro. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. It has been a pleasure, as it usually is when we have trans brilliance working together. Have a nice day, everyone.